Hey everyone, this is Paul. And in this video, what I'm gonna do is explain how Bayes' theorem actually originally started as an argument for the resurrection of Jesus. I'll tell you how Bayes and Richard Price formulated this argument as a response to David Hume. And I'll try to explain how Bayes' theorem works so you can understand how it was invoked as an argument for Christianity. So the first thing to realize is Bayes' theorem is used all over the place. It's used in neuroscience, belief updating. It's a fundamental result in statistics, but it's also used in determining whether people have diseases, in artificial intelligence, in communication systems, and even in my own work, which kind of, this is a paper I did recently on stable diffusion. You can see Bayes' theorem here all over the place. And as one person said in the paper, Scientific Inference, Bayes' theorem is to the theory of probability what the Pythagorean theorem is to geometry. So really important that you understand it. It's a really cool fundamental result. But what most people don't realize is that it was actually originally an argument for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, what Richard Price did is he took Reverend Bayes, so Bayes was a Presbyterian minister, and Price was also a minister, and Price was the one who published Bayes' work after Bayes died, kind of packaged it. Now, Price added a lot of his own contributions too. Some people think that it should be called the Bayes and Price theorem, but obviously Bayes did a lot of the original work, and this was in response to Hume's argument. So let's take a look at Hume's argument and what Bayes and Price were responding to. So Hume's argument against miracles is goes like this. Look, Premise one, a miracle like a resurrection would be a violation of natural laws. Premise two, it is impossible that natural laws are violated. So the conclusion is therefore miracles are impossible. Now, if you look at this, you're probably gonna realize this is a pretty weak argument. In fact, because it begs the question. Premise two is basically the same as your conclusion. If we're asking if miracles are possible, that's saying whether or not there are exceptions to natural law. So a lot of people pointed this out. So if you look at later versions of Hume's work, later versions of the essay concerning human understanding, he kind of relaxes this and argues it like this. He would say, look, nature typically believes behaves according to natural laws described by physics. Premise two, a miracle like a resurrection would be a violation of natural laws. And the conclusion is therefore a miracle is highly unlikely or it's an extraordinary event. Um, when you hear the Sagan standard, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This is kind of like invoking Hume's maxim, a wise man apportions his belief to that which has the greatest evidence. Now, if you look at this argument, you may still say, well, just because it's unlikely doesn't mean it's unreasonable to believe. And that's actually true. I think this argument's a good argument. It's a fair argument, but it doesn't necessarily say we shouldn't believe in a resurrection. So that's where Hume actually takes this version of the argument and formulates it against belief or identification of a miracle, not necessarily the existence of it. So what Hume would say in this version of the argument, he would already you know, say a miracle is highly unlikely, we would grant this. And then he would say, look, people lie or are mistaken all the time. It's much com more common that people lie or are mistaken. So his first conclusion is it's more probable that someone would lie than a miracle would occur. Then he's going to give his famous maxim, we should apportion our beliefs to whichever hypothesis has the greatest probability. Premise four, a miracle happening is always less likely than any evidence to the contrary. And the conclusion is, therefore, we should never believe in any miracle claim like a resurrection. Now, if you look at this particular argument, um, what's interesting is where Bayes and Price would reply. Um, they would actually argue, probably grant most of this, where they're gonna argue against it is premise four, saying a miracle happening is always less likely than any avail evidence to the contrary. They may say, look, it's more likely and more probable that someone would lie than a miracle would happen. But under the case where you have perhaps multiple witnesses or you have all of this other overwhelming evidence that any alternative hypothesis is even more unlikely, you can actually overcome your initial prior improbability. The other problem with this argument is it could lead you into a type two error where you fail to recognize a miracle when one actually happens. That's kind of another issue that's beside the point. So we're not going to focus on that particular piece here. So this is kind of some of the motivation behind Bayes and Price's theorem. The main idea goes like this. So suppose you have a probability space or a sample space. What we're going to do is imagine that each point in this space is an outcome. And the way I like to think about it is think of this is like a dartboard and you're throwing a dart and wherever that dart lands is the outcome that you get. So each point is equally likely, we're gonna assume that. And collections of these outcomes are called events. So you can think of events sort of like, like being a set you know, in this space. And the way we draw this, you know, the larger this event is, the more likely it is to happen to the point where you're definitely guaranteed to get a point in the sample space and then how much, how many outcomes this thing takes up is basically telling you what the probability of that event is. So you can have different events. You can actually have events that overlap and this is where you get the intersection of events. So the event A and B is like saying you're, you know, you threw a dart and it landed in both the A and B target together. Now what Bayes' theorem did, what Bayes realized is thinking about the event that's at the intersection of them, P of A and B, that's basically the same as getting event A, 
restricting your scope to A and then looking at just B's overlap given that you're now kind of only looking at A. And you can do the same thing for B. To look at the intersection of A and B, you simply look at B, you restrict your scope to B, and then you just look at the part of A that intersects with B now that you've restricted your scope to B. Now, this notation, this set theoretic way of looking at it came after Bayes, but his general idea is the same. So what we're doing is we're conditioning on specific events, which is sort of like restricting our scope beforehand and after the fact. So P of A and B is just saying, what's the probability of both A and B occurring? P of A times P of B given A is like saying, what's the probability that A happens? And then now that I know A happened, what's the probability that B happens? So that's that second part. What's the probability that B happens given that I've already seen A? And you can do it the same thing the other side too. So P of A in this case is called the prior, meaning before, because this is what you're restricting your scope to. And then P of B given A, this is called the posterior, meaning after. So after you've restricted your scope. So that's why you combine the prior and the posterior and you get what's called the joint or the, the event where the two are together. So it happens either particular way. You know, I'm using then and before in quotes because there's not necessarily a temporal element. It just has to do with when you sort of restrict your scope, when in a sort of logical way. Now, Bayes' point was, so imagine the following. So, so you have this idea, you have this, this theorem, and imagine you have this sample space sigma, like we did before, and you have two events, an event T here, and I'll explain what these letters mean in a second, and an event R, which tends to overlap with T. Now, both T and R have very, very small probabilities. Now, if we take T and we blow it up, what we're going to see is T and R actually overlap for most of T. So it takes up most of, you know, if you look at R and T, you don't have a lot of T where R doesn't also happen. And if you look at the event not R, what this is doing is taking the sample space and sort of cutting out the whole of R. So now we're restricting our scope to not R. Um, the event not R and T is really, really small relative to the rest of the space. So what this is like kind of saying is even if P of R is much, much smaller than P of not R, right? Even if whatever your hypothesis R is, is this is called the prior. If your prior is much smaller than not, than not happening, it's not necessarily the case that your prior conditioned on your evidence is less than your prior condition on it not happening. So this is like saying, so you look at this and suppose I threw a dart. It's very unlikely that I land it in T or R. But if I tell you that I landed it somewhere in T, it's actually much more likely that it's also in R than it's not um, under the case that I told you that I threw the dart at the board and then I told you I landed it somewhere in T. And that's, I think, the point that Bayes is trying to make here. So in this case, what he's going to do is he's going to say, look, let R be the resurrection hypothesis that Jesus rose from the dead and let not R be any other hypothesis. And T is going to be the testimony or evidence we do have, we have access to. And what Bayes' point is, is look, as long as P of R is non-zero and all this stuff is in you know continuous land, then T can actually overcome R's initial prob improbability. And if these things are continuous, you can always find such a T that will overcome R's initial probability, making R much more likely than not R given the evidence or after the fact after you see this particular thing. So in these pictures, notice that even though P of R is much less than P of not R, and you can make these as small as possible, P of R conditioned on T, or after you see your evidence T, is much greater than P of not R given T. So when we look at the resurrection, when somebody like Bart Ehrman, who's a skeptic New Testament scholar, says something like, look, with respect to Jesus, we have numerous independent accounts of his life and the sources lying behind the Gospels and the writings of Paul, sources that originated in Jesus' native tongue, Aramaic, and that can be dated to within just a year or two of his life before the religion moved to convert pagans in droves. What we see is Bayes using this, this kind of the same idea to argue that the resurrection is actually a very probable hypothesis and reasonable to believe. What Bayes would say is, look, with multiple independent witnesses, the probability of deception, lying, conspiracy goes down with each additional credible witness. So even if your prior is really, really small, even if it's really unlikely that somebody has risen from the dead, then given the evidence that you have, which could be multiple independent credible witnesses, if you find enough of them, right, the probability of the resurrection given the evidence will outweigh the, the alternative hypothesis, kind of all things considered or given the evidence. Now, one thing, you know, we should mention, you can't really prove a resurrection happened just as you can't really prove that the resurrection didn't happen. You don't get these kind of proofs in history. But Bayes' point is really like, what is it about reasonable belief? Um, he's pointing out belief in the resurrection can still be reasonable and even the most reasonable hypothesis given the available evidence you have. So 
in this case, you know, really what's going on here, we can grant that a resurrection may be unlikely and demands more evidence than things that are more common to convince ourselves or convince a skeptic, right? Yeah, we would admit that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, but one of the points Bayes is going to say is, look, what could be more unlikely are alternative hypotheses that could be even more contrived given the available evidence that's available. And, you know, one point that some people like William Lane Cray are going to make, like, you know, yeah, you can have a resurrection, but if you believe in God, that's not that big of a deal. Whereas what you're having to propose as an alternative hypothesis are things like, say, a psychological miracle that are causing normal men and women to become conspirators and liars and who would be willingly martyred for their lies. Craig would say, look, there's zero evidence that any of this happened. A biological miracle that prevented Jesus from dying on the cross, despite all the evidence that we have. Or as Augustine said in The City of God, right, even if the unbeliever rejects all biblical miracles, he's still left with one stupendous miracle, which is all one needs. The of Christianity, the growth of the church, these sorts of things. Um, one of the problems with Hume's argument that people point out is consider somebody winning a royal flush, right? Consider something really, really improbable. Now, this would be an extraordinary event. Someone following Hume's logic should disbelieve it ever happens because, once again, it's much more likely that someone would lie about having a royal flush than actually getting one. But people do get the royal flush sometimes, and what I think Bayes' point would be is, yeah, it's unlikely if you just had one person that they actually got a royal flush. But suppose it was the case that so you told me that you got a royal flush last night playing poker. So I investigated it and I found that there were five people playing poker with you. And all five of them said that you had gotten a royal flush, including people who lost money to you. So they have no really good reason to lie. It's kind of embarrassing. Well, then maybe it's the case that all of that evidence combined overcomes the initial improbability of you getting a royal flush playing poker. So this is what John Ehrman, who's an agnostic, says, look, while it's fair to ask for more evidence for extraordinary events, what is not fair is the hocus pocus that Hume apologists and Hume himself have used in an attempt to deal with examples like this royal flush one that certainly appear to fall on the Hume miracle side of the cut. And of course, this is a funny, funny comic, right? Showing the disciples, okay, here's the plan. We get the body out of the tomb and stash it somewhere. Then we come back and tell a story that will probably get us killed. Who's with me on this? So kind of goofy. So a few interesting notes is that Thomas Sherlock, who was responding to Hume, actually got this point too. He says, look, when the thing testified is contrary to the order of nature, and at first sight at least impossible, what evidence can be sufficient to overturn the constant evidence of nature, which she gives us in constant and regular method of her operation? So he's asking this question, and then what he says, look, while it's true, he's going to grant Hume's point that men don't believe things easily on the testimony of others, things which seem to be improbable or impossible, the reason for this isn't because the thing itself necessarily has no evidence but because of the hearer's preconceived opinion outweighs the credit of the reporter and makes his veracity be called into question. Um, so John Ehrman is basically saying, look, it's ironic that the most subtle and interesting arguments offered by theists of this era, of, of Bayes' era, relied on the emergence of probability and that the irreligion promoted by Hume's attempts to answer the second set of questions is, in a word, sophomoric when examined under the lens of Bayesianism or using Bayesian reasoning for belief updating. So what, what Ehrman says, citing a few other scholars, is, look, the emergence of probability made it possible to ask in place of, can the truth of Christianity be demonstrated or is it supported by authority, the questions like, look, is it likely that the gospel narrative is accurate or how good is the evidence for God's existence? So moving from this sort of binary yes or no to matters of degree or degrees of belief, as we would say. So as a result, when somebody like Pelogia says, look, if the person I trust most in the world tells me they saw a man's arm grow back, I'm not going to take their word for it. Your vague general reliability of the Bible arguments aren't going to cut it. Um, it's unclear, I would say, what his point is. It could be two things. One of them could be that the testimony of a single observer may not be enough to establish something highly improbable. And I think Bayes would agree with the sentiment, right? P of E condition on R, this is looking at it the other way, needs to be really large relative to P of E given not R to overcome P of R. So if the resurrection hypothesis is really improbable. Um, the evidence needs to explain this way, way, way better than the evidence explaining the not resurrection to be able to overcome this initial improbability. But remember, Bayes' point is specifically that multiple independent witnesses and other sorts of circumstantial evidence can eventually overcome any initial non-zero probability. Or Pelogia could be saying something like this, no amount of evidence can ever come, overcome our prior knowledge. But think about it like this, right? The person who makes this claim is is so dogmatic, they will never update their beliefs in light of new evidence. At this point, I don't think it's even worth arguing with this person because they're totally closed off to updating or revising their belief because they've already decided. Um, and, and in which case, you know, Theist is going to point out, you know, so much for following the evidence where it leads, basing your beliefs on evidence or anything like that. If you're going to 
assume a zero prior before investigation, a priori. Um, the other thing you can ask us is like, how did one come to their current beliefs? It certainly wasn't on the basis of some sort of Bayesian, rational Bayesian update, since Bayesian updates are always provisional, always in result of degrees of beliefs. Um, one of the things to point out here is assuming a zero prior to argue against a Bayesian update is begging the question because what you're doing when you assume a zero prior is saying, I've already decided that this event is impossible without looking at any evidence. So I am not willing to follow the evidence where it leads because I know for a fact already before looking at any evidence that this cannot happen, which this is just dogmatism at that point, right? So really the problem is the fact that, that, um, Miracle claims have low priors is not necessarily reasons to doubt that miracles happen. Um, using the fact that miracle claims have low priors to argue against them happening is kind of question begging because we're not necessarily claiming that miracles are going to happen more frequently than the laws of nature hold. In particular, a miracle is an exception to the law of nature, so it can't be ruled out on the basis of a low prior anyway. We're not saying that Jesus was risen from the dead naturally in accordance with the normal laws of probability. We're talking about something that's happening outside of the normal kind of inductive order of things, um, which is this point. And then the other thing, and Hume himself realized this, is there are serious problems trying to justify induction itself. There's a serious problem saying, yeah, because the sun rose all of the days in the past, it's going to rise tomorrow. So using probability in this way can often be misleading or manipulative. Remember, we're just using probability to describe events. Probability doesn't really cause things to happen. It's more of a description of the standard regularity of things outside of you know, other sorts of intervention. So a Hume-type argument may work against the identification of a miracle, um, comparing the probability of events. I think then it actually works pretty well um, versus actually arguing that it somehow ontologically disproves miracles. That doesn't work. And I think the, t the key takeaway here is this, right? Thinking something is unlikely to happen isn't necessarily a good reason to think it did not happen prior to investigation, especially since the event may end up being highly likely given the available evidence. And I think that's the point, right? What Plato said, follow the evidence, or Socrates, Plato, follow the evidence where it leads. Follow the evidence after the fact. It's okay to think something has a low prior given your experience, but as long as you're not too dogmatic and you're open-minded about it, it may be the case that the best explanation of the data is an event that's highly improbable when you take into account all of the available evidence. The last thing I'll say is Price and Hume, I think, were friends. They had some really nice things to say to each other, which really just goes to show that scholarship can be conducted between friends even when you disagree. So Hume, responding to Price and Bayes, said, look, it is but too rare to find a literary controversy conducted with such proper decency and good manners. You know, you are like a true philosopher. While you overwhelm me with the weight of your arguments, you give me encouragement by the mildness of your expressions. You address me as a man mistaken, but capable of reason and conviction. And Price, returning the favor to Hume in four dissertations, basically said Hume was, quote, a writer whose genius and abilities are so distinguished as to be above any of my commendations. Um, Hume admitting later, you know, I own to you that the light in which you've put this controversy is new and plausible and ingenious and perhaps solid, but I must have some more time to weigh it before I can pronounce this judgment with satisfaction to myself. So Hume, totally understandable, is going to say, look, like, let me just get some time to think about this so I can, you know, piece this together and see. Unfortunately, we don't know if Hume ever came to change his mind on this. We don't have any other writings. But regardless, I think what this shows is Hume had a good argument. Price and Bayes came up with a good response. And in this sort of clash, we now, what comes out of this is a result that has really influenced and impacted the rest of the world, which just goes to show um, it's important to listen to these objections and to come up with responses. And also this can be done, you know, in a friendly way. So anyway, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.